Beneath this castle lie the secrets of the historical part of Mombasa city. From the skies, you can see why the early visitors and the white settlers chose this place. Our cameras have been roaming through Mombasa's old town looking for artifacts that tell the story of how Kenya's second largest city began. By the virtue of the geological features of the world, maybe at the time of the Pleistocene or the Jurassic period, this area must have been under the sea, as it was actually in most of the islands which are found in the Indian, Indian Ocean, notably Mombasa, Zanzibar, Seychelles, and the rest of the world, uh, of the areas in the Indian Ocean. But of course, so when these gentlemen came here, they saw this massive, high, huge cliff overlooking the area or the entrance into the harbor. We are simply putting Kenya's history into perspective, and it's exciting. Fort Jesus. 428 years ago, the Portuguese sailors constructed this military castle on a coralline island in a bay of the Indian Ocean. It was a place for the troops captain. A fortress and a military base that signified power, majesty and fear. It was a symbol of dominance. Whoever controlled the castle controlled the old port and consequently trade routes. Today, we are accompanied by a Mombasa-based historian and tour guide, Peter Tolle. It's the first time I am visiting this historical place. My name is Peter Tolle. Welcome to Mombasa's Old Town. Uh, the place where Mombasa itself actually started in the early years, especially where all the foreigners came through. And uh, in this particular entity of Mombasa's Old Town, on my right hand side here, we have got the oldest uh, police station in the country, which was established by the British way back in 1899. The main concept of establishing this as a prison, as a police station rather, was because uh, at one time the building which is right extreme on behind me, uh, which is called For Jesus, had been used by the British for not close to 60 years as uh, the prison of, of the days uh, at the time between 1895 to 1958. And uh, for this particular place here, the building, as you can see behind me, however, it changed turn and it's no longer a police station anymore. Later on, when it was closed down, the Fort Jesus was called as prison in 1958. They decided now to, to revert this particular police station now to the town center, which is currently known as the Central Police Station. Inadvertently, you see that uh, at one time, a gentleman called Mr. Ali said now to open it as a curio market, but now, of course, he's tried to, he sold the building uh, to another gentleman, and at the moment, of course, this one now is owned by a foreigner, uh, of course, uh, who wants to open it as, not only as a souvenir shop down here, but also on top, he wants to establish a, hot, a hotel and a small restaurant. By the time Kenya was being placed under the British protectorate and Mombasa as its headquarters in 1895, the white settlers had begun to build key infrastructure. On the corner here, we have also got uh, this Ndiaku. Ndiaku was established as the second oldest road in the country way back in 1902 by the British, declared so. And uh, on this other corner here, there is something quite more interesting about the building, which had been established as a police station. This police station, it got three kinds of doors, if you talk about the art. The structural part of the outer frames of this door here is made entirely in Arabic design or Omani design as you can see that's why you can see the inscriptions in Arabic then you've also got this particular fat part here Alice Kudio market part the outer layers there is actually 
carved in, in what you call the seal style, but this middle one is a typical British design. This other one here you can see on the right hand side, the frame is entirely Arabic in design, but the door in the middle there is a steel style which actually was imported here by the Gujarati community from India. So this style is called the cassette style door or the Gujarati door. The original and typical Omani design door is the one you can see right up front over here. This one over here, as you can see, it's got the frame, which is entirely Arabic in design. Also, it's got that there, like a piers of a mosque down there. It's the typical Omani door. Unfortunately, some studs have, have actually fallen down. They've been stolen for that matter. But it's a typical and original Omani door. Moving through the old town's narrow streets and high houses with carved ornamental balconies, we are looking for the footprints of the people who shaped Kenya's chief port city. The old town covers an area of 72 hectares and is inhabited by a mix of local, Arabic, Asian and white settlers. Tole has studied the history of Mombasa for over two decades now. And the first hospital in Mombasa, which was established, or rather in Kenya, is the current one known as the Mombasa Hospital, which was predominantly meant only for the Europeans. Now, the Mombasa Hospital is the one which is behind for Jesus, but now, as we speak, the one for the Asians, because it was very much segregated, is the one you can see right in front of us here. The one with kind of like orangish, yellowish. This is the first Indian hospital in Kenya. It was called the Pandit Hospital, which also harbored the first pharmacy in the country, which was known as uh, Edward and Rose. And currently, the same pharmacy of Edward and Rose is owned by the same, same family and is found in the town center next to a hotel called the Splendid Hotel. Splendid hotel. And uh, later on, this particular Pandit Hospital instead now was transferred into the modern day hospital that we know as Pandia Hospital Mombasa. The use of these buildings might be different today, but they were so important during the 19th century and the early 20th century. These are not just old structures, but remains of a historical center of power. The text engraved on these walls reveal clues about the early colonial days and the transformation that followed. Win a golden return in Africa. Climate and soil alike work for the settler. Crops of all sorts flourish prolifically. Labor is cheap. The life is healthy and free from home conventions and restrictions. It is the ideal life for the energetic and enterprising. Stories of colonial days have fascinated for decades, but the most tantalizing of them all, Mombasa, Old Town. Here, colonial engineers build a street pattern that one could find a way around it. Its backbone was the old port. Now, this area was an entity which was like flat land, very much an, a very good an entity for uh, business. So when the Arabs had come here, from this entity here all the way down approximately to a place of around like 200 meters, it was an entity which was flat land and a very good place for doing trade. Mostly, sometimes you could also find auctioneering of slaves around here when the Arabs were here. When the Portuguese came also, they had taken it as a port of importance. However, they could not be easily be accepted by the Omanis taking it over. So that's why they ended up, of course, building the Fort Jesus, which is not far away from here, like 300 meters away. But the British, when they came now, and having found the problems of enslavement, that's why they decided now to officially set their base, not far away from here, like 200 meters away, a place called the Levin House. Then later on, they decided now to make a decree, late 1895, and through an acceptance by the Sultan of Zanzibar, ended up, of course, building this particular building here by use of the Indian workers, and this now became a place of center of administration. So we can say the British, in fact, ended up setting this place here as a place of importance, not only geopolitically, but also on the concept of commerce. The daunting journey of the modern Mombasa had humble beginnings, talk of the evolution of shelter and transportation. 
it all began around this port, now called the Old Port. It was then interconnected by a trolley truck built in 1890. It was used by the British to move around the island. Trolleys were found all over the island. They took folks to work, to shop, or children to school. Well, there were two trams. One was pushed behind by two people or pulled in front by use of a camel or a horse in the town centre, or the other one was normally used for transport of cargo. And the main line started from the new port of Mombasa, currently known as Kilini Harbour, and went all the way down to the old harbour of Mombasa, which was like 3.5 kilometres long, and to be precise, it actually started from 1890 to 1921. We had a donkey cart, but we couldn't use the donkey because he wouldn't go, so we went in the donkey cart, mother and I, with, with two boys in the shafts and two boys pushing behind. That's how we used to go to Nairobi and go to the races. The trolley truck ran from Baraki Hinaway Road, formerly Vasco da Gama Street, to the government square, which is the customs area and Levin House, and on to Nkuruma Road, formerly McDonald Terrace, past the old law court, on to Kilindini. It also provided access to this place, Jubilee Hall. Put up to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1897 and also used as a meeting place for old town elders until 1950s. So in the beginning it was just going to the Treasury Square which is about 300-400 uh, about, uh, meters from the port. But how did it work? They had wheels like trains that fitted into the rails. But for them to move they had to be powered somehow and they would be pushed. There are two types. There are types that were for luggages and there are types for passengers. So passengers would sit and of course they would pay for that particular service to be pushed to wherever they were going. Yeah, so that was a mode of transport uh, during that time. Until 1923, this truck was mainly used by government officials, the most senior of whom had their own trolleys and received monthly allowances to pay the Africans employed to push them. Trolley tickets were purchased from this building. It was then the post office and also one of the trolley terminal. The building was opened in 1899. It was used by Indians building the East Africa Railway Line to send messages and money to their families back in India. It was also the temporary immigration office during World War I that is between 1914 and 1918. Its location, Government Square. This here is the Government Square, an entity whereby since the early years had been positioned in a place which is quite very much important strategically, juxtaposed to the old port of Mombasa on my right hand side. Now the building which is known as the Government Square on the right, my left hand side over here, had been strategically constructed because from here most of the government offices were established in this entity like as you can look also behind me here I've got the post office uh, which was established way back in 1899 and this government square here had been operating until the time when the British were here in fact when the British were here were the ones who made it of, of prominence in the sense that uh, the captain who actually the gentleman who became the first commissioner Mr. Hadij operated his activities controlling the country Kenya from this particular entity Hadi is the man who is commonly known in Nairobi as Mr. Hadi. Or oh, when you leave Nairobi, the Goretti corner, you go to Lenana, you go to Karen Hadi. That was the gentleman who actually became, which became actually an administrative man who at the end of the day also ended up making a treaty with Labon Lenana and Nairobi now was made a collection center for railway materials for building between Mombasa and Uganda. So we can say also later on a gentleman in around 1890s, a gentleman known as Mr. Ali Navizram came down here uh, having come all the way from Bagamoyo and imported so many clerks and mach uh, merchandise, masons and artisans who were endowed with different talents to come and uh, carve out the you know, woods and 
uh, in different shapes and sizes so that at least they could be used in beautification of the buildings around the area. That's why you can see like a balcony like this is very well beautifully carved in and mostly they used, prefer to use uh, teak wood which was entirely imported from India. At the same time also, uh, this place which was also known as Sanaa Gallery inside when the Bangamayo man Mr. Alina Visram was here, later on his son from the proceeds of the accrued uh, Abdul Rasul decided now to build, in memory of his dad, a school which is not far away from here, known as Aldina Visram High School, which is around the area of the modern day Coast General Hospital. So, this entity was important because of the fact that all the cargo that had been brought from the new port of Mombasa, old port of Mombasa rather than behind me here, were handed over through Mikokoteni, what you call the handcuts, then distributed to different areas within the, town, the town's environs. The British set up most of their government buildings here because of its proximity to a flourishing port. As the name suggests, everything governmental revolved around here. The workers who were building the railway line, they happened of course to do a very important job of the fact that uh, they could, they, once they wanted to communicate with their families back home, their mails were inscribed, inscribed, then they were sorted out in the port here before they could be shipped here either to destinations back in Europe or rather sometimes all the way up to India. Throughout the early colonial period, this square flourished. It was used by the British government as a launching pad as it sought to open up to the interior of the East Africa region. But as business flourished, the need for a second port arose. Ships coming into Mombasa were becoming bigger than the old port could handle. To address the need, a deeper Kilindini port was constructed. The emergence of this port meant that the government square lost its importance. Because now after the construction of the new port, most of the luggages that were coming in here would now go to the new port and be transported now into the new uh, Kenya-Uganda railway, railway line. And as a consequence, major shipping businesses shifted too. Indeed, this place has buildings of historical and architectural value. Tolle tells me they once belonged to some of the most influential merchants of the old town. In the 19th century, business was booming here, and as time went on, new trends set in. Wood carvings emerged as a symbol of Swahili art in decoration of doors and other items. Every elegant building was fit with a carved door. It was like the higher the tenement, the bigger the gateway, the heavier the padlock, and the huger the iron studs, and definitely the greater the owner's dignity. Now, in front of us, we got a building which is white here, known famously as the White House of Mombasa. The White House was built towards the end of the 18th century by Ismaili Jivanji, a Bohra Indian. It was rented to the church missionary as a ladies' house for nuns from 1893 to 1904. By 1909, the building housed an American farm known as Arnold Cheney, dealing in ivory. Why was it called the White House? Principally it was called the White House and painted still the color white because at the time of the First World War, 1914-1918, the Germans, when well, the First World War began and the Germans were based in Tanganyika, modern day Tanzania. They had come to take the commercial city of Mombasa from the British. They came as close as Diani to come and take the commercial city of Mombasa, such that the British now were so much actually frightened to a point that they had ask, ask, ask assistance from outside parties. So they happened to ask, ask, ask assistance from the Americans. And in this particular case, the Americans now ended up, of course, opening an entity here by, by hiring a building in the town of Mombasa, which, which was owned by Mr. Jivanji, and uh, who was an Indian actually merchant. And this became the first American embassy in, or consulate rather, in Mombasa, or rather in Kenya, in the year between 1914 up to 1918. And to be precise, this is also the first house also to be wired using electricity, by using generator in the whole of Kenya, in the time of 1914 and 1918. So the first door here, the bigger one, was the main consulate. 
and the other part there in the middle used to be the main residence of the uh, consulate and also his dining room. This building is an example of the Mombasa architecture with covered balconies on the front and backside supported by wooden brackets. The elevation is also adorned with arched doors and windows surrounded by a rich plaster work decoration. This door reveals Indian influence. I am the Kenyan historian.